Okay, so let's uh, do a couple of three examples over here. Let's uh, first do an example where I have x going from uh, r into r, and f of x is going to be x squared. So x and y axes here. This is a graph of f. And let's, uh, let me actually use some colors here. Let's, uh, let's suppose that this is uh, 2 down here. So this is 4 over here. They're not on the same, not, not the same scale, obviously, on the two axes. And so if that's 2, then this is 1. And this is 1. And so let's just note that here we have, uh, if this is the set S, let's say it's the, the interval from, uh, from 1 to 2, then clearly f of S is the interval from 1 to 4. But let's also notice that uh, if uh, this goes across to here, then this is minus 1. And this goes across to here, this is minus 2. So let's say this is the set S prime. And so we have f of S prime is equal to f of s equals 1, 4. So it's clear then that uh, this function is not 1 to 1 because we have points in, let me use a different color for the image here. So this is the image. This is f of s and f of s prime. And so we have points in the image. In fact, we have points in the range of f uh, that hit, get hit by more than one point from the domain. So this function's not 1 to 1. And is it on to? It is not on to r because none of the negative elements of r get hit. So this is neither 1 to 1 nor on to. But now let me just make a little change here. Suppose I say instead, I define this function to be from r to r plus, so that the target space is now just r plus, and I don't have the negative values of r in here anymore. The function now is still not one to one for the same reason, but now it is onto. It does map onto all of r plus because every non-negative number, there is one, in fact, there are two numbers in the domain that map to every non-negative number except zero, which only has one that gets mapped into it. But everything in R plus gets hit by something uh, in X. And uh, I think that's a good enough, uh, uh, good enough for that example. Let's take a second example. Let's uh, again have f go, in this case, from r uh, plus into r plus. And let's let f of x be x over x plus 1. Now, I had it going just from r plus and not all of r because I really couldn't define this when x is minus 1 because the denominator would be 0 and I wouldn't have this well defined. I could define it for other negative numbers, but I've chosen to say let's just define the function um, on r plus. So let's draw the graph of the function. And the function looks like this. So let's say here's 0, here's 1, and let me draw, see if I can draw it without curving it down too much as I often do. And so the graph of f looks like 
like this. Asymptotic to one from below. Uh, let's note that, let's say this is one, and this would be a half here, and let's say this is about two, this would be two-thirds over here, and so uh, we have the same thing. We could, uh, we could say that this is, for example, we could make that the set S, and then the uh, image of that set would be the set over here. I won't go into detail on that, but let's just note that this function now, here we find that F is one to one, and F is, is on, well, no, hold on, it's not. Let's, let's take that back here for a moment. F is one to one. Uh, let's say the uh, range of F, that is the closed interval from zero up to one, but not including one. So the range of F, I'll do, well, I'll use a different color. So the range of F is everything from zero up to, but not including the number one. So that's the range of F. And F is clearly not onto all of R plus because it only maps to here. So F is not onto the entire target space. That's supposed to say range there. Um, but now, again, let me alter the function a little bit here. And let's say now, uh, instead, let's say f is the same function except that its target space is just the, in the interval from 0 to 1, not including 1. So now, the function's still one to one, the graph is still the same, and now this blue part is the entire target space. It's, this is playing the role of capital Y in our definition of a function and playing the role of capital Y in all of these properties and sets over here. This is now playing the role of Y because it's the target space, and now we have F is both one to one and onto the target space. So it's a one to one correspondence. It's a one to one correspondence between the non negative real numbers and the interval from zero to one, including zero but not one. And the fact that it's a one to one correspondence means that it's certain. So a certain degree, they're like the same set. They behave the same way. Now, there are other properties of the sets that are important, like their order, what the open and closed sets are, and so on. But for our purposes right now, the fact that this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sets, and we say the sets can be placed into one-to-one -one correspondence with one another. I didn't write that down, but when we have this, we do say that the sets X and Y can be placed in one-to-one -one correspondence with one another. It means that to a certain degree, they're like the same set. They behave in the same way for many purposes. Okay, so these are two good little examples, simple but good examples to bring out some of these ideas. Let's uh, look at uh, one or two more uh, examples kind of quickly. So let's take this off and we'll look at a couple other examples. Okay, let's uh, do another example, and this example, unlike the first two, the, and actually you could say the first three, because the first example we had a finite domain and a finite target space. Uh, we had several different finite domains that we used, x1, x2, x3, and a finite target space, which was just h, two element set. We did a couple of examples where we had real functions. So functions defined on a domain, which is the real numbers, and the target space was the real numbers. So they were real functions and real valued. 
And so now, let's do a couple of examples where we have a, a function that maps from R2 into R2. So let's say our first example will be one in which uh, f of x is a times x, where a is a matrix. Whoop, let's get that off of there. So a is a two by two matrix. Uh, let's say a is the matrix uh, one, one half, and one, and two. Okay, so that tells me that F is mapping from R2 into R2 because it's a two by two matrix. So that says F is mapping from R2 into R2. We have two dimensional vectors, two component vectors that A gets multiplied by, so those are in R2, and what we get out is a two component vector, so that'll be in R2 as well. So let's, uh, for this, we can't draw the domain and the target space. We can't draw the graph in a single diagram because the graph is four dimensional. There's a two dimensional domain and a two dimensional target space. So what we're gonna have to do, and this is common, so what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to draw the domain and the target space separately and see how the function works in going from one to the other. So let's put our domain down here. Let's say this is x1 and this is x2. And let's put the target space over here. So this is y, let's call it y1 and y2, just so we have f of x equals y. You don't have to do that, but it's, it's, we're kind of used to doing that kind of thing. So uh, let's first ask, uh, what is the range of f? Uh, does f map onto all of r2, or does f just map into some subset of r2? Is the range all of r2, all of the target space? or some sub proper subset of the target space. And so the answer to that, we can find out by looking at the determinant of A. And so what's the determinant of this matrix A? Well, it's two, product of these two, minus the product here. So it's two minus a half, product of these is a half. It's two minus a half, so that's one and one half, or three halves. And that is not zero. So that tells me that the matrix is non-singular. And if the matrix is non-singular, then it has an inverse matrix, which will also be two by two. And so the inverse matrix exists. Let me do a little aside here. One more thing that I should have maybe said a moment, a couple of moments ago. I think it's worth saying here. Notice that I said, because we had a two by two matrix, F was mapping from R2 to R2 because it, it gets multiplied by two component vectors, two dimensional vectors, and the result is a two dimensional vector. But you can see from that, if we go further, for any Rn into Rn, or let's put it a different way, for any n by n matrix, not just two by two, any n by n matrix, that's going to give us a function from Rn into Rn. But we will still have the question that I just raised, which is, what's the range of F? Even in the case where it's an n by n matrix, from R, so the F goes from Rn to Rn, the question still uh, arises, what is the range of F? And the answer to the question you can kind of see, and we'll develop a little bit more, uh, is again, even the n by n case is going to be to look at the determinant of the matrix. And if the determinant is non-zero, so that the matrix is non-singular, that means that A inverse exists. A inverse, of course, would also be n by n, two by two here. And if the inverse exists, as it does in this example, it's two by two, then we know 
that, and let's just put this down here. For every y in R2, for every y in the target space, there exists a unique x in the domain. Both of these are R2. That's just because the target space and the domain are the same, or both R2. So for every point in the target space, there exists a unique point in the domain such that x is A inverse times y, because that's what it means to have this A inverse matrix. That's a matrix we can multiply by vectors over here, y's, and we get a specific, unique vector x from doing this. So you can see that that tells me that for every y in R2, there is an x in the domain that goes to it. So this tells me that, therefore, or I could really say IE, and it is the case, that F, therefore, is onto all of R2, because every Y, every point in R2, has an X that got mapped to it, right? If this is the case, then, of course, Y is also equal to A times X. Uh, it's on to R2, and of course it's also one-to-one, -one because this says there exists a unique X that gets mapped to it. There's only one X, that's A inverse Y, so there's only one X over here that satisfies A times X equals Y, so it's on to, and it's one-to-one, -one. so it's a one-to-one -one correspondence between R2 and itself between R2 and R2. So that's the case here. You can already anticipate, in our second example, in a few moments we'll do this, you can already anticipate that if the determinant is zero, so that the, A, the inverse, ma inverse matrix doesn't exist, then all bets are off about this. This isn't going to work the same way. Uh, but for now, for our example here, we have a non-singular matrix inverse exists, our function is one-to-one -one and onto, a one-to-one -one correspondence, and so what I want to do now, and this is something that we very often do uh, to enable us to kind of figure out what our function is doing, and it's especially the case that we often do this to figure this out, and things work pretty much like what we're going to do, when the function is defined by a matrix like this. We are going to see functions like that, which are called linear transformations or linear mappings, um, uh, quite a bit. They, a lot of the course is going to be based on functions like this, so this is a good kind of introduction or preview of things we're going to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take several colors and I'm going to identify uh, the unit, what we call the unit vectors here in the domain. So let's take this vector right here, and that's the vector, or the n-tuple, the pair, the ordered pair, 1, 0. And I want to see what f of this x, f of this point over here is. Well, you can easily see that's going to be the vector, which is the column, the, left, the first column of a, that's going to be 1, 1 half. So let's put over here that this is 1, and then this would be 2, and let's say this is 1, this is 2, and so the vector 1, 0 gets mapped by f to the vector 1, 1 half, so that's right here. Okay, uh, and let's even put on here that this is f of 1, 0. Let's uh, use a different color here for this vector here, this ordered pair. That's 0, 1. And what's the image over here? What does 0, 1 get mapped to? It gets mapped to 1, 2, as you can easily see. And so 
that image is going to be here. That's supposed to be 1, 2. And so this is f of 0, 1. And last, let's look at the vector 1, 1. So this is 1, 1. And that gets mapped to, uh, of course, it's the sum of these two vectors. It gets, it gets mapped to the sum of these two vectors, which is going to be 2 and 2 and a half. So I'll go up from 2 to about 2 and a half. That'll be about there. So that is f of 1, 1. And now I am going to say, let's see what happens to not just these points, but the entire unit square, which I'll refer to as S. So it's not too hard to see. You, you can check this real easily for yourself. Oh, and we should add one more point. And that's, this is the origin. So this is the zero vector, zero, zero. And of course, the zero vector over here is f of the zero vector. And so I want to see how f transforms the unit square to over here. So it's easy to see. I'll leave it to you to verify this, but it's quite straightforward. that the image of this unit square is this roughly diamond-shaped region, a kind of a stretched diamond, let's say. And so let me actually refer to this as D for diamond. And that's F of S. That's the image of S. So according to our definition of the image of a set, it says the image of a set S a subset of the domain is exactly the set of all points that in the target space that get hit from points in S. It's just the set of all f of x's for x's in S. And that's exactly what this is here. So, as I said, you can check to see that this is the case. So let's write that down here too. We have the image of the set S is the set that I've called D. We can write it out analytically, but we can see what that is here. Let's take a few other sets and see what happens to them because they're going to be somewhat instructive also. So let's look at the entire non-negative uh, x1 axis. And in fact, let's call it capital X1. And let me put plus because it's the non-negative part of the uh, of that axis. That is just going to get mapped to multiples of the image of 1, 0. So that's going to get mapped to this line here. So this is this line just from the origin out, because I'm only using the non-negative part of the axis. This is f of x1 plus, as I've called it. And uh, let's see what happens over here. Same kind of thing is going to happen if I draw in here the entire uh, x2 axis and call that capital X2, then the image of capital X2 is going to be everything along here. And I should extend these all the way down here like this and all the way down here like this, of course. And so and let's uh, actually write that here. This is f of capital X2. And uh, let's, uh, I could write that down, but I haven't given names to these over here. But we can see that here again, we have two cases of the image of a set. So here, by the way, uh, it's useful to note that here, when I write that this is the image of x1 plus, x1 plus is playing the role of s over here in the definition of the image of a set. So I look at the image of a set in the definition, it says f of s is a certain set, 
and now I have x1 plus playing the role of s. Here I have x2. Well, I should put a little plus on this, but I'm going to take the pluses off in just a minute. But f, f of x2 plus is this line over here. x2 plus is playing the role of s over here. So as I said when I first introduced this idea of some object or some item playing the role of something in a definition or a theorem, here we have a couple of instances of that. And it is, I think, ext an extremely useful concept here, a useful way to think about things. So x2 plus playing the role of s, x1 plus playing the role of s. Um, and of course here, s is playing the role of s. So uh, it, it, it's literally true. This set isn't just any set s, it's, it's that set. Uh, let's go a little further here. Well, let's say a couple of things. Let's first notice that the image, oh, in fact, let's do that. Let's, let's actually say that, and let me here use, uh, I will use this blue color here. And so let's call this set in between these two rays coming out, sort of half lines coming out. Uh, let's call that C, capital C, and that stands for cone, just like the D, I use that to stand for this roughly diamond-shaped region. So this is something we actually call technically, formally, a cone in mathematics. We aren't going to be dealing with that for a while. I think we will deal with it. We'll actually use that later on in the course, but it's useful to kind of see it in advance here. So this is a kind of a cone-shaped region, so we actually call it a cone. And so let's note that f of r2 plus is this cone, this cone-shaped region. f of x1 plus is this, f of x2 plus is this, and everything in between them here, again, as you can easily check, everything in between them here gets mapped to something in here. And so you might guess from that that f is reducing the size of things in the, in the domain. That it takes something in the domain, like the non-negative quadrant, and squeezes it down and makes it smaller. That would be a pretty good guess, but it would actually be a wrong guess, okay? And uh, I think if one thing to do to see that it might not be right is to back up and say, well, we have f as a one-to-one -one correspondence between this set and, well, between all of r here, and all of r2 and all of r2 here. So it actually turns out that f is a also a one-to-one -one correspondence then between the non-negative quadrant and this cone-shaped region over here because every x gets mapped into here, every x gets mapped into a unique point over here, or that is everything over here, the inverse will be in the non-negative quadrant. So it's one-to-one -one, and you can see that it's onto. So it's a one-to-one -one correspond, f is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this set and this set. Now it looks like things are getting squeezed smaller, but actually they're not. And in fact, one way to see that they're not is to look at the area. The area of this, if these are the units, think of each of these as one meter, I guess it's closer to one inch in, in the diagram from my perspective. So let's even say this is an inch, okay? So this is an inch, this is an inch, this is one square inch. Over here, the area of D let me put that, uh, let me just put that as, let me put that down here. The area uh, of that diamond-shaped region is, what do you think? Well, it's not too hard to figure out the area. I'll leave that to you to do. The area of this is one and a half square units. So if this is one square inch, if this is an inch, that's an inch, this is an inch, this is an inch, then this is one and one-half square inches. Now, you might have noted that, hey, 
That's the same as the determinant. Well, that's an interesting coincidence. Just happened that the determinant was one and a half, and the area of this was one and a half times bigger than the area of the unit square. It's not a coincidence. We'll see that later on, that one feature of the determinant is that it tells us what the mapping, the function or transformation does to sets in R2 or in fact in Rn. So in this R2 case, the fact that it determines one and a half actually tells us that anything over here that has area, a given area, let's say four square units, let's say the square that's two units on each side, which would be four square units, the image over here will be one and one half times as large in area. So that image would be one and a half times four, which would be six square inches over here. And of course, if the determinant's less than one, it makes things, our function makes things smaller over here. But this function actually makes things bigger. Even though it looks like the, the non-negative quantity is getting squashed down to something smaller, it's not because, loosely speaking, it's getting squashed down here, but it's getting stretched out here by more. So that's how we get the uh, area of something over here getting actually bigger over here. Let's do a one or two more little quick things here with this example. Let's take off the plus here. Well, I didn't put the plus on here to begin with, but so imagine it was there and we'll take it off. Okay, so now we're going to let x1 be the entire uh, x1 axis. And um, actually, I didn't write down the formal definition of these sets, but it's clear. In fact, I'll, I'll write it down here. Just, just I'll write down the one for x1. So here, I should have perhaps written that x1 plus is the set of all x's in R2 plus, because I had that plus here, such that x2 equals 0. And of course, x2 plus is all the vectors for which x1 is 0. Uh, and that they're in R2 plus. And so what I'm now doing is taking off the plus. I'm taking off the plus, but it's kind of a mess. Okay, let's see if I can take off the plus a little more effectively here. Well, that looks a little better. And so now I'm saying let x1 be this entire axis here, and let's let um, x2 be the entire x2 axis. And so, of course, they get mapped not just to this ray or half line. Now, those axes get mapped into the entire line through the origin uh, here with the slope 2. And the x1 axis gets mapped to here. And so now it's the case that you can actually see, you can see now pretty completely what, is, what f is doing to any set here in the domain. It's mapping this into here. It's mapping the negative quadrant down here. It's mapping this quadrant and spreading it out in, so that it actually spreads it out into here. Maps this a quadrant down into, down into here between the pink and the orange lines. We could do the same thing with any other set here, we can figure out what it does over here. But notice how useful it is to, in particular, to work with the unit square, because then it's easy to see what happens to these vectors. This vector here always goes to the first column over here. This vector goes to the second column. This vector goes to the sum of the two columns. And so I can very quickly see what's happening to uh, anything over here by looking at what happens under the function f to the unit square. Well, I think we've got a lot going on here. <laughs> Lots of arrows all over the place. You a lot of arrows over here too. Uh, pretty busy diagram over here. Uh, I think that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to say about this example. And so let's take this example off and we will do a final example. Uh, where we're going to have the determinant equal to zero, a singular matrix A. So we'll take this off and then we'll do that last example.